chapter 10 british india from the mutiny to world war 1 by the year 1857 the british had established complete political control of the indian subcontinent which they ruled directly or through subordinate princes they had established an authoritarian system of government making use of mughal practice and tradition and supported by an efficient civil service and a relatively efficient army the mutiny and great revolt of 1857 to 59 when soldiers of the bengal army mutinied in merit on 10th may 1857 tension had been growing for some time the immediate cause of military disaffection was the deployment of the new breech loading enfield rifle the cartridge of which was purportedly greased with pork and beef fat when muslim and hindu troops learned that the tip of the enfield cartridge had to be bitten off to prepare it for firing a number of troops refused for religious reasons to accept the ammunition these recalcitrant troops were placed in irons but their comrades soon came to their rescue they shot the british officers and made for delhi 40 miles 65 kilometer distant where there were no british troops the indian garrison at delhi joined them and by the next nightfall they had secured the city and mughal fort proclaiming the aged titular mughal emperor bahadur shah II as their leader there at a stroke was an army a cause and a national leader the only muslim who appealed to both hindus and muslims nature and causes of the rebellion this movement became much more than a military mutiny there has been much controversy over its nature and causes the british military commander sir james outram thought it was a muslim conspiracy exploiting hindu grievances or it might have been an aristocratic plot set off too soon by the merit outbreak but the only evidence for either of these was the circulation from village to village of chapati or cakes of unleavened bread a practice that though it also occurred on other occasion was known to have taken place at any time of unrest the lack of planning after the outbreak rules out these two explanations while the degree of popular support argues more than a purely military outbreak nationalist historians have seen in it the first indian war of independence in fact it was rather the last effort of traditional india it began on a point of caste pollution its leaders were traditionalists who looked to reviving the past while the small new westernized class actively supported the british and the leaders were not united because they sought to revive former hindu and muslim regimes which in their heyday had bitterly clashed but something important was required to provoke so many to seize the opportunity of a military uprising to stage a war of independence the military cause was both particular and general the particular reason the greased cartridges for the enfield rifles was a mistake rectified as soon as it was discovered but the fact that explanations and reissues could not quell the soldiers suspicions suggests that the troops were already disturbed by other causes the bengal army of some 130 triple zero indian troops may have contained as many as 40000 brahmans as well as many rajputs the british had accentuated caste consciousness by careful regulations had allowed discipline to grow lax and had failed to maintain understanding between British officers and their men. In addition, the General Service Enlistment Act of 1856 required recruits to serve overseas if ordered, a challenge to the castes who composed so much of the Bengal army. To these points may be added the fact that the British garrison in Bengal had been reduced at this time to 23,000 men because of troop withdrawals for the Crimean and Persian wars. The general factors that turned a military mutiny into a popular revolt can be comprehensively described under the heading of political, economic, social, and cultural westernization. Politically, 
Many princes of India had retired into seclusion after their final defeat in 1818. But the wars against the Afghans and the Sikhs and then the annexations of Dalhousie alarmed and outraged them. The Muslims had lost the large state of Awadh. The Marathas had lost Nagpur, Satara and Jhasi. Further, the British were becoming increasingly hostile toward traditional survivals and contemptuous of most things Indian. There was therefore both resentment and unease among the old governing class, fanned in Delhi by the British decision to end the Mughal imperial title on Bahadur Shah's death. Economically and socially, there had been much dislocation in the land-holding class all over northern and western India as a result of British land revenue settlements setting group against group. There was thus a suppressed tension in the countryside, ready to break out whenever governmental pressure might be reduced. Then came the western innovations of the now overconfident British. Their educational policy was a westernizing one, with English instead of Persian as the official language. The old elites, schooled in the traditional pattern, felt themselves slighted. Western inventions such as the telegraph and railways aroused the prejudice of a conservative society, though Indians crowded the trains when they had them. More disturbing to traditional sensibilities were the interventions, in the name of humanity, in the realm of Hindu custom, e.g., the prohibition of sati, the campaign against infanticide, the law legalizing remarriage of Hindu widows. Finally, there was the activity of Christian missionaries, by that time widespread. Government was ostentatiously neutral, but Hindu society was inclined to regard the missionaries as eroding Hindu society without openly interfering. In sum, this combination of factors produced, besides the normal tensions endemic in India, an uneasy, fearful, suspicious, and resentful frame of mind, and a wind of unrest ready to fan the flame of any actual physical outbreak. The Revolt and its Aftermath The dramatic capture of Delhi turned Mutini into full-scale revolt. The whole episode falls into three periods. First came the summer of 1857, when the British, without reinforcements from home, fought with their backs to the wall. The second concerned the operations for the relief of Lucknow in the autumn and the third was the successful campaign of Sir Colin Campbell, later Baron Clyde, and Sir Hugh Henry Rose, later Baron Strathnane of Strathnane and Jhasi, in the first half of 1858. Mopping up operations followed, lasting until the British capture of rebel leader Tanshia Topi in April 1859. From Delhi the revolt spread in June to Kanpur, Kanpur, and Lucknow. The surrender of Kanpur, after a relatively brief siege, was followed by a massacre of virtually all British citizens and loyal Indian soldiers at Kanpur. The Lucknow garrison held out in the residency from July 1st, in spite of the death of Sir Henry Lawrence on July 4th. The campaign then settled down to British attempts to take Delhi and relieve Lucknow. In spite of their apparently desperate situation, the British possessed long-term advantages, they could and did receive reinforcements from Britain. They had, thanks to the resolution of Sir John Lawrence, a firm base in the Punjab, and they had another base in Bengal, where the people were quiet. They had virtually no anxiety in the South and only a little in the West, and they had an immense belief in themselves and their civilization, which gave resolution to their initial desperation. The mutineers, on the other hand, lacked good leadership until nearly the end, and they had no confidence in themselves and suffered the guilt feelings of rebels without a cause, making them frantic and fearful by turns. In the Punjab were some 10,000 British troops, which made it possible to disarm the Indian regiments, and the recently defeated six were so hostile to the Muslims that they supported the British against the Mughal restoration in Delhi. A small British army was improvised, which held the ridge 
before Delhi against greatly superior forces until Sir John Lawrence was able to send a siege train under John Nicholson. With this, and the aid of rebel dissensions, Delhi was stormed and captured by the British on September 20th, while the Emperor Bahadur Shah surrendered on promise of his life. Downcountry operations centered on the relief of Lucknow. Setting out from Allahabad, Sir Henry Havelock fought through Kanpur to the Lucknow residency on September 25th, where he was besieged in turn. But the back of the rebellion had been broken and time gained for reinforcements to restore British superiority. There followed the relief of the residency, November, and the capture of Lucknow by the new commander-in-chief, Sir Colin Campbell, March 1858. By a campaign in Awadh and Rohilkhand, Campbell cleared the countryside. The next phase was the Central Indian Campaign of Sir Hugh Rose. He first defeated the Gwalior contingent and then, when the rebel Stanshya Topi and Rani Lakshmi Bai of Jhasi had seized Gwalior, broke up their forces into more battles. The Rani found a soldier's death and Tanshya Topi became a fugitive. With the British recovery of Gwalior, 20th June 1858, the revolt was virtually over. The restoration of peace was hindered by British cries for vengeance, often leading to indiscriminate reprisals. The treatment of the aged Bahadur Shah, who was sent into exile, was a disgrace to a civilized country. Also, the whole population of Delhi was driven out into the open, and thousands were killed after perfunctory trials or no trials at all. Order was restored by the firmness of Charles John Canning, later Earl Canning, first Viceroy of India, governed 1858-62, whose title of clemency was given in derision by angry British merchants in Calcutta, and of Sir John Lawrence in the Punjab. Ferocity led to grave excesses on both sides, distinguishing this war in horror from other wars of the 19th century. Measures of prevention of future crisis naturally began with the army, which was completely reorganized. The ratio of British to Indian troops was fixed at roughly 1, 2 instead of 1, 5, 1 British, and 2 Indian battalions were formed into brigades so that no sizable station should be without British troops. The effective Indian artillery, except for a few mountain batteries, was abolished, while the Brahmans, and Rajputs of Awadh were reduced in favour of other groups. The officers continued to be British, but they were more closely linked with their men. The army became an efficient professional body, drawn largely from the Northwest and aloof from the national life. Climax of the Raj, 1858 85 the quarter century following the bitter Indian revolt of 1857-59, though spanning a peak of British imperial power in India, ended with the birth of nationalist agitation against the Raj, British rule. For both Indians and British, the period was haunted with dark memories of the mutiny, and numerous measures were taken by the British Raj to avoid another conflict. In 1885, however, the founding of the Indian National Congress marked the beginnings of effective, organized protest for national self-determination. Government of India Act of 1858 On 2 August 1858, less than a month after Canning proclaimed the victory of British arms, Parliament passed the Government of India Act, transferring British power over India from the East India Company whose ineptitude was primarily blamed for the mutiny, to the crown. The merchant company's residual powers were vested in the Secretary of State for India, a minister of Great Britain's cabinet, who would preside over the India office in London and be assisted and advised, especially in financial matters, by a Council of India, which consisted initially of 15 Britons, seven of whom were elected from among the old company's court of directors and eight of whom were appointed by the crown. 
Though some of Britain's most powerful political leaders became secretaries of state for India in the latter half of the 19th century, actual control over the government of India remained in the hands of British viceroys, who divided their time between Calcutta, Kolkata, and Simla, Shimla, and their steel frame of approximately 1,500 Indian civil service, ICS, officials posted on the spot throughout British India. Social Policy On 1st November 1858, Lord Canning announced Queen Victoria's proclamation to the princes, chiefs and peoples of India, which unveiled a new British policy of perpetual support for native princes and non-intervention in matters of religious belief or worship within British India. The announcement reversed Lord Dalhousie's pre-war policy of political unification through princely state annexation, and princes were left free to adopt any heirs they desired so long as they all swore undying allegiance to the British crown. In 1876, at Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli's prompting, Queen Victoria added the title Empress of India to her regality. British fears of another mutiny and consequent determination to bolster Indian states as natural breakwaters against any future tidal wave of revolt thus left more than 560 enclaves. Of autocratic princely rule to survive, interspersed throughout British India, for the entire nine decades of crown rule. The new policy of religious non-intervention was born equally out of fear of recurring mutiny, which many Britons believed had been triggered by orthodox Hindu and Muslim reaction against the secularizing inroads of utilitarian positivism and the proselytizing of Christian missionaries. British liberal socio-religious reform therefore came to a halt for more than three decades. Essentially, from the East India Company's Hindu Widows Remarriage Act of 1856 to the Crown's Timid Age of Consent Act of 1891, which merely raised the age of statutory rape for consenting Indian brides from 10 years to 12. The typical attitude of British officials who went to India during this period was, as the English writer Rudyard Kipling put it, to take up the white man's burden. By and large, throughout the interlude of their Indian service to the crown, Britons lived as super-bureaucrats, Pukka sahibs, remaining as aloof as possible from native contamination in their private clubs and well-guarded military cantonments, called camps, which were constructed beyond the walls of the old, crowded native cities in this era. These new British military towns were initially erected as secure bases for the reorganized British regiments and were designed with straight roads wide enough for cavalry to gallop through whenever needed. The old company's three armies, located in Bengal, Bombay, Mumbai and Madras, Chennai, which in 1857 had only 43,000 British to 228, 000 native troops were reorganized by 1867 to a much safer mix of 65,000 British to 140, 000 Indian soldiers. Selective new British recruitment policies screened out all non-martial, meaning previously disloyal, Indian castes and races from armed service and mixed the soldiers in every regiment thus permitting no single caste or linguistic or religious group to again dominate a British Indian garrison. Indian soldiers were also restricted from handling certain sophisticated weaponry. After 1869, with the completion of the Suez Canal and the steady expansion of steam transport reducing the sea passage between Britain and India from about three months to only three weeks, British women came to the East with ever greater alacrity, and the British officials they married found it more appealing to return home with their British wives during furloughs than to tour India, as their predecessors had done. While the intellectual caliber of British recruits to the ICS in this era was, on the average, probably higher than that of servants recruited under the company's earlier patronage system. British contacts with Indian society diminished in every respect. Fewer British men, for example, 
openly consorted with Indian women, and British sympathy for and understanding of Indian life and culture were, for the most part, replaced by suspicion, indifference, and fear. Queen Victoria's 1858 promise of racial equality of opportunity in the selection of civil servants for the Government of India had theoretically thrown the ICS open to qualified Indians, but examinations for the services were given only in Britain and only to male applicants between the ages of 17 and 22. In 1878, the maximum age was further reduced to 19. Who could stay in the saddle over a rigorous series of hurdles? It is hardly surprising, therefore, that by 1869 only one Indian candidate had managed to clear these obstacles to win a coveted admission to the ICS. British royal promises of equality were thus subverted in actual implementation by jealous, fearful bureaucrats posted on the spot. Government Organization from 1858 to 1909 the Government of India was an increasingly centralised paternal despotism and the world's largest imperial bureaucracy. The Indian Councils Act of 1861 transformed the Viceroy's Executive Council into a miniature cabinet run on the portfolio system and each of the five ordinary members was placed in charge of a distinct department of Calcutta's government, home, revenue, military, finance and law. The military commander-in-chief sat with this council as an extraordinary member. A sixth ordinary member was assigned to the Viceroy's Executive Council after 1874, initially to preside over the Department of Public Works, which after 1904 came to be called Commerce and Industry. Though the Government of India was by statutory definition the Governor-General in Council, Governor-General remained the Viceroy's alternate title. The Viceroy was empowered to overrule his councillors if ever he deemed that necessary. He personally took charge of the Foreign Department, which was mostly concerned with relations with princely states and bordering foreign powers. Few Viceroys found it necessary to assert their full despotic authority, since the majority of their councillors usually were in agreement, but in 1879 Viceroy Lytton, Govan 1876-80, felt obliged to overrule his entire council in order to accommodate demands for the elimination of his government's import duties on British cotton manufacturers. Despite India's desperate need for revenue in a year of widespread famine and agricultural disorders, from 1854 additional members met with the Viceroy's Executive Council for legislative purposes and by the Act of 1861 their permissible number was raised to between 6 and 12, no fewer than half of whom were to be non-official. While the Viceroy appointed all such legislative councillors and was empowered to veto any bill passed on to him by this body, its debates were to be open to a limited public audience and several of its non-official members were Indian nobility and loyal landowners. For the Government of India, the Legislative Council sessions thus served as a crude public opinion barometer and the beginnings of an advisory safety valve that provided the Viceroy with early crisis warnings at the minimum possible risk of parliamentary type opposition. The Act of 1892 further expanded the Council's permissible additional membership to 16, of whom 10 could be non-official, and increased their powers, though only to the extent of allowing them to ask questions of government and to criticise formally the official budget during one day reserved for that purpose at the very end of each year's legislative session in Calcutta. The Supreme Council, however, still remained quite remote from any sort of parliament. Economic Policy and Development Economically, this was an era of increased commercial agricultural production, rapidly expanding trade, early industrial development, and severe famine. The total cost of the mutiny of 1857-59, which was equivalent to a normal year's revenue, was charged to India 
and paid off from increased revenue resources in four years. The major source of government income throughout this period remained the land revenue, which, as a percentage of the agricultural yield of India's soil, continued to be an annual gamble in monsoon rains. Usually, however, it provided about half of British India's gross annual revenue, or roughly the money needed to support the army. The second most lucrative source of revenue at this time was the Government's continued monopoly over the flourishing opium trade to China. The third was the tax on salt, also jealously guarded by the Crown as its official monopoly preserve. An individual income tax was introduced for five years to pay off the war deficit, but urban personal income was not added as a regular source of Indian revenue until 1886. Despite continued British adherence to the doctrine of laissez faire during that period, a 10% customs duty was levied in 1860 to help clear the war debt, though it was reduced to 7% in 1864 and to 5% in 1875. The above-mentioned cotton import duty, abolished in 1879 by Viceroy Lytton, was not reimposed on British imports of peace goods and yarn until 1894, when the value of silver fell so precipitously on the world market that the government of India was forced to take action, even against the economic interests of the home country, i.e. textiles in Lancashire, by adding enough rupees to its revenue to make ends meet. Bombay's textile industry had by then developed more than 80 power mills, and the Indian industrialist Jamsidji, Jamshedji, N. Tatas, 1839-1904, huge empress mill was in full operation at Nagpur, competing directly with Lancashire mills for the vast Indian market. Britain's mill owners again demonstrated their power in Calcutta by forcing the government of India to impose an equalizing 5% excise tax on all cloth manufactured in India, thereby convincing many Indian mill owners and capitalists that their best interests would be served by contributing financial support to the Indian National Congress. Britain's major contribution to India's economic development throughout the era of Crown rule was the railroad network that spread so swiftly across the subcontinent after 1858, when there were barely 200 miles, 320 km, of track in all of India. By 1869 more than 5,000 miles, 8,000 km, of steel track had been completed by British railroad companies, and by 1900 there were some 25,000 miles, 40,000 km, of rail laid. By the start of World War I, 1914-18, the total reached 35,000 miles, 56,000 km, almost the full growth of British India's rail net. Initially, the railroads proved a mixed blessing for most Indians, since by linking India's agricultural, village-based heartland to the British imperial port cities of Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta, they served both to accelerate the pace of raw material extraction from India and to speed up the transition from subsistence food to commercial agricultural production. Middlemen hired by port city agency houses rode the trains inland and induced village headmen to convert large tracts of grain yielding land to commercial crops. Large sums of silver were offered in payment for raw materials when the British demand was high, as was the case throughout the American Civil War, 1861-65, however, but after the Civil War ended, Restoring raw cotton from the southern United States to Lancashire mills, the Indian market collapsed. Millions of peasants weaned from grain production now found themselves riding the boom and bust tiger of a world market economy. They were unable to convert their commercial agricultural surplus back into food during Depression years and from 1865 through 1900 India experienced a series of protracted famines which in 1896 was complicated by the introduction of the bubonic plague, spread from Bombay, 
where infected rats were brought from China. As a result, though the population of the subcontinent increased dramatically from about 200 million in 1872, the year of the first almost universal census, to more than 319 million in 1921, the population may have declined little between 1895 and 1905. The spread of railroads also accelerated the destruction of India's indigenous handicraft industries, for trains filled with cheap competitive manufactured goods shipped from England. Now rushed to inland towns for distribution to villages, underselling the rougher products of Indian craftsmen. Entire handicraft villages thus lost their traditional markets of neighboring agricultural villagers, and craftsmen were forced to abandon their looms and spinning wheels and return to the soil for their livelihood. By the end of the 19th century, a larger proportion of India's population, perhaps more than three-fourths, depended directly on agriculture for support than at the century's start, and the pressure of population on arable land increased throughout this period. Railroads also provided the military with swift and relatively assured access to all parts of the country in the event of emergency, and were eventually used to transport grain for famine relief as well. The rich coal fields of Bihar began to be mined during this period to help power the imported British locomotives, and coal production jumped from roughly 500, triple zero tons in 1868 to some 6, triple zero, triple zero tons in 1900 more than 20, triple zero, triple zero tons by 1920. Coal was used for iron smelting in India as early as 1875, but the Tata Iron and Steel Company, which received no government aid, did not start production until 1911, when, in Bihar, it launched India's modern steel industry. Tata grew rapidly after World War I, and by World War II it had become the largest single steel complex in the British Commonwealth. The jute textile industry, Bengal's counterpart to Bombay's cotton industry, developed in the wake of the Crimean War, 1853-56, which, by cutting off Russia's supply of raw hemp to the jute mills of Scotland, stimulated the export of raw jute from Calcutta to Dundee. In 1863 there were only two jute mills in Bengal, but by 1882 there were 20, employing more than 20,000 workers. The most important plantation industries of this era were tea, indigo, and coffee. British tea plantations were started in North India's Assam Hills in the 1850s and in South India's Nilgiri Hills some 20 years later. By 1871 there were more than 300 tea plantations, covering in excess of 30,000 cultivated acres, 12,000 hectares, and producing some 3,000 tons of tea. By 1900 India's tea crop was large enough to export 68,500 tons to Britain, displacing the tea of China in London. The flourishing indigo industry of Bengal and Bihar was threatened with extinction during the Blue Mutiny, violent riots by cultivators in 1859-60, but India continued to export indigo to European markets until the end of the 19th century when synthetic dyes made that natural product obsolete. Coffee plantations flourished in South India from 1860 to 1879, after which disease blighted the crop and sent Indian coffee into a decade of decline. Foreign Policy The Northwest Frontier British India expanded beyond its company borders to both the Northwest and the Northeast during this initial phase of crown rule. The turbulent tribal frontier to the Northwest remained a continuing source of harassment to settled British rule, and Pathan, Pashtun, raiders served as a constant lure and justification to champions of the forward school of imperialism in the colonial offices of Calcutta and Simla and in the imperial government offices at Whitehall, London. Russian expansion into Central Asia in the 1860s provided even greater anxiety and incentive to British proconsuls in India 
as well as at the Foreign Office in London, to advance. The frontier of the Indian Empire beyond the Hindu Kush, and indeed, up to Afghanistan's northern border along the Amu Darya. Lord Canning, governed 1856-62, however, was far too preoccupied with trying to restore tranquility within India to consider embarking upon anything more ambitious than the Northwest Frontier Punitive Expedition Policy, commonly called Butcher and Bolt, which was generally regarded as the simplest, cheapest method of pacifying the Pathans. As Viceroy, Lord Lawrence, governed 1864-69, continued the same border pacification policy and resolutely refused to be pushed or lured into the ever-simmering cauldron of Afghan politics. In 1863, when the popular old emir, Dust Muhammad Khan, died, Lawrence wisely refrained from attempting to name his successor, leaving the Dust's 16 sons to fight their own fratricidal battles until 1868, when Shir Ali Khan finally emerged victorious. Lawrence then recognized and subsidized the new emir. The Viceroy, Lord Mayo, governed 1869-72, met to confer with Shir Ali at Ambala in 1869 and, though reaffirming Anglo-Afghan friendship, resisted all requests by the emir for more permanent and practical support for his still precarious regime. Lord Mayo, the only British viceroy killed in office, was assassinated by an Afghan prisoner on the Andaman Islands in 1872. The Second Afghan War Russia's glacial advance into Turkestan sufficiently alarmed Prime Minister Disraeli and his Secretary of State for India, Robert Salisbury, that by 1874, when they came to power in London, they pressed the government of India to pursue a more vigorous interventionist line with the Afghan government. The Viceroy, Lord Northbrook, governed 1872-76, resisting all such cabinet promptings to reverse Lawrence's non-interventionist policy and to return to the militant posture of the first Afghan war era resigned his office rather than accept orders from ministers whose diplomatic judgment he believed to be disastrously distorted by Russophobia. Lord Lytton, however, who succeeded him as Viceroy, was more than eager to act as his Prime Minister desired, and, soon after he reached Calcutta, he notified Shir Ali that he was sending a mission to Kabul. When the Emir refused Lytton permission to enter Afghanistan, the Viceroy bellicosely declaimed that Afghanistan was but an earthen pipkin between two metal pots. He did not, however, take action against the kingdom until 1878, when Russia's General Stolitov was admitted to Kabul while Lytton's envoy, Sir Neville Chamberlain, was turned back at the border by Afghan troops. The Viceroy decided to crush his neighbouring Pekin and launched the Second Afghan War on 21 November 1878 with a British invasion. Shir Ali fled his capital and country, dying in exile early in 1879. The British army occupied Kabul, as it had in the First War, and a treaty signed at Gandamak on 26 May 1879 was concluded with the former Emir's son. Yaqubi Khan. Yaqubi Khan promised, in exchange for British support and protection, to admit to his Kabul court a British resident who would direct Afghan foreign relations, but the resident, Sir Louis Cavignari, was assassinated on September 3, 1879, just two months after he arrived. British troops trudged back over the passes to Kabul and removed Yaqubi from the throne, which remained vacant until July 1880, when Abda Alraman Khan, nephew of Shir Ali, became emir. The new emir, one of the shrewdest statesmen in Afghan history, remained secure on the throne until his death in 1901. The Viceroy, Lord Lansdowne, governed 1888-94, who sought to reassert a more forward policy in Afghanistan, 
did so on the advice of his military commander-in-chief, Lord Roberts, who had served as field commander in the Second Afghan War. In 1893 Lansdowne sent Sir Mortimer Durand, the government of India's foreign secretary, on a mission to Kabul to open negotiations on the delimitation of the Indo-Afghan border. The delimitation, known as the Durand Line, was completed in 1896 and added the tribal territory of the Afridis, Masuds, Waziris and Swatis as well as the chieftainships of Chitral and Gilgit to the domain of British India. The 9th Earl of Elgin, governed 1894-99, Lansdowne's successor, devoted much of his viceregal tenure to sending British Indian armies on punitive expeditions along this new frontier. The Viceroy, Lord Curzon, governed 1899-95, however, recognized the impracticality of trying to administer the turbulent frontier region as part of the large Punjab province. Thus, in 1901 he created a new northwest frontier province containing some 40,000 square miles, about 1 lakh square kilometer, of transcendence and tribal borderland territory under a British chief commissioner responsible directly to the Viceroy. By instituting a policy of regular payments to frontier tribes, the new province reduced border conflicts, though for the next decade British troops continued to fight against Mahuds. Waziris, and Jakka Khel Afridis. The Incorporation of Burma British India's conquest of Burma, Myanmar, was completed during this period. The Second and Global War, 1852, had left the Kingdom of Awa, Upper Burma, independent of British India, and under the rule of King Minden, 1853-78, who built his capital at Mandalay, steamers bringing British residents and private traders up the Irrawaddy River from Rangoon, Yenden, were welcomed. Minden, noted for convening the 5th Buddhist Council at Mandalay in 1871, the first such council in some 1,900 years, was succeeded by a younger son, Thibaut, who in February 1879 celebrated his ascendancy to the throne by 80 siblings massacred. Thibaut refused to renew his father's treaty agreements with Britain, turning instead to seek commercial relations with the French, who were then advancing toward his kingdom from their base in Southeast Asia. Thibaut sent envoys to Paris, and in January 1885 the French signed a treaty of trade with the Kingdom of Awa and dispatched a French consul to Mandalay. This envoy hoped to establish a French bank in Upper Burma to finance the construction of a railway and the general commercial development of the kingdom, but his plans were thwarted. The Viceroy, Lord Dufferin, governed 1884-88, impatient with Thibaut for delaying a treaty agreement with British India, goaded to action by British traders in Rangoon, and provoked by fears of French intervention in Britain's sphere, sent an expedition of some 10,000 troops up the Irrawaddy in November 1885. The Third and War ended in less than a month, with the loss of hardly 20 lives, and on 1st January 1886, Upper Burma, a kingdom of greater area than Britain, and with a population of some 4, triple zero, triple zero, was annexed by proclamation to British India. Indian Nationalism and the British Response, 1885-1920 The Indian National Congress held its first meeting in December 1885 in Bombay City, while British Indian troops were still fighting in Upper Burma. Thus, just as the British Indian Empire approached its outermost limits of expansion, the institutional seed of the largest of its national successors was sown. Origins of the Nationalist Movement Provincial roots of Indian nationalism, however, may be traced to the beginning of the era of crown rule in Bombay, Bengal, and Madras. Nationalism emerged in 19th century British India both in emulation of and as a reaction against the consolidation of British rule and the spread of Western civilization. 
there were moreover two turbulent national mainstreams flowing beneath the deceptively placid official surface of british administration the larger headed by the indian national congress which led eventually to the birth of india and the smaller muslim one which acquired its organizational skeleton with the founding of the muslim league in 1906 and led to the creation of pakistan many english educated young indians of the post mutiny period emulated their british mentors by seeking employment in the ics the legal services journalism and education the universities of bombay bengal and madras had been founded in 1857 as the capstone of the east india company's modest policy of selectively fostering the introduction of english education in india at the beginning of crown rule the first graduates of these universities reared on the works and ideas of jeremy bentham john stuart mill and thomas macaulay sought positions that would help them improve themselves and society at the same time they were convinced that with the education they had received and the proper apprenticeship of hard work they would eventually inherit the machinery of british indian government few indians however were admitted to the ics and among the first handful who were one of the brightest surendranath banerjee 1848 to 1925 was dismissed dishonorably at the earliest pretext and turned from loyal participation within the government to active nationalist agitation against it banerjee became a calcutta college teacher and then editor of the bengali and founder of the indian association in calcutta in 1883 he convened the first indian national conference in bengal anticipating by 2 years the birth of the congress on the opposite side of india after the first partition of bengal in 1905 banerjee attained nationwide fame as a leader of the swadeshi of our own country movement promoting indian made goods and the movement to boycott british manufactured goods the renowned indian statesman surendranath banerjee 1848 to 1925 was one of the founders of modern india as a young man he attempted unsuccessfully to serve in the indian civil service at the time virtually closed to ethnic indians he then became a teacher and founded a college in calcutta now kolkata which was later named for him banerjee attempted to bring hindus and muslims together for political action and for 40 years he put forward a nationalist viewpoint in his newspaper the bengali twice elected president of the indian national congress he advocated for an indian constitution on the canadian model he was elected in 1913 to two legislative councils and later was knighted 1921 in 1924 he was defeated by an independence candidate whereupon he retired to write his autobiography a nation in the making 1925 during the 1870s young leaders in bombay also established a number of provincial political associations such as the pune sarvajanik sabha pune public society founded by mahadev govind ranade 1840 to 1901 who had graduated at the top of the university of bombay's first bachelor of arts class in 1862 ranade found employment in the educational department in bombay taught at elphinstone college edited the hindu prakash helped start the hindu reformist prarthana samaj prayer society in bombay wrote historical and other essays and became a barrister eventually being appointed to the bench of bombay's high court ranade was one of the early leaders of india's emulative school of nationalism as was his brilliant disciple gopal krishna gokhale 1866 to 1915 later revered by mohandas karamchand gandhi 1869 to 1948 as a political guru preceptor gokhale an editor and social reformer taught at Ferguson College in Pune Pune and in 1905 was elected president of the congress moderation and reform were the keynotes of gokhale's life 
and by his use of reasoned argument, patient labor, and unflagging faith in the ultimate equity of British liberalism, he was able to achieve much for India. Bal Gangadhar Tilak, 1856-1920, Gokhale's colleague at Ferguson College, was the leader of Indian nationalism's revolutionary reaction against British rule. Tilak was Pune's most popular Marathi journalist, whose vernacular newspaper, Kesri Lion, became the leading literary thorn in the side of the British. The Lokamane, revered by the people, as Tilak came to be called after he was jailed for seditious writings in 1897, looked to Orthodox, Hinduism and Maratha history as his twin sources of nationalist inspiration. Tilak called upon his compatriots to take keener interest and pride in the religious, cultural, martial and political glories of pre-British Hindu India, in Pune, former capital of the Maratha Hindu glory. He helped found and publicize the popular Ganesha, Ganpati, and Shivaji festivals in the 1890s. Tilak had no faith in British justice, and his life was devoted primarily to agitation aimed at ousting the British from India by any means and restoring Swaraj. Self-rule or independence to India's people While Tilak brought many non-English educated Hindus into the nationalist movement, the orthodox Hindu character of his revolutionary revival, which mellowed considerably in the latter part of his political career, alienated many within India's Muslim minority and exacerbated communal tensions and conflict. The Viceroyalties of Lytton and Lord Ripon Govern 1880-84, prepared the soil of British India for nationalism, the former by internal measures of repression and the futility of an external policy of aggression, the latter indirectly as a result of the European community's rejection of his liberal humanitarian legislation. One of the key men who helped arrange the first meeting of the Congress was a retired British official, Alan Octavian Hummey, 1829-1912, Ripon's radical confidant. After retiring from the ICS in 1882, Hame, a mystic reformer and ornithologist, lived in Simla, where he studied birds and theosophy. Hame had joined the Theosophical Society in 1881, as had many young Indians, who found in theosophy a movement most flattering to Indian civilization. Helena Blavitsky 1831-91, the Russian-born co-founder of the Theosophical Society, went to India in 1879 to sit at the feet of Swami Dayananda Saraswati, 1824-83, whose back to the Vedas reformist Hindu society, the Arya Samaj, was founded in Bombay in 1875. Dayananda called on Hindus to reject the corrupting excrescences of their faith, including idolatry, the caste system, and infant marriage, and to return to the original purity of Vedic life and thought. The Swami insisted that post-Vedic changes in Hindu society had led only to weakness and disunity, which had destroyed India's capacity to resist foreign invasion and subjugation. His reformist society was to take root most firmly in the Punjab at the start of the 20th century and it became that province's leading nationalist organization. Blavitsky soon left Dayananda and established her own Samaj, whose Indian headquarters were outside Madras city, at Adyar. Annie Besant, 1847-1933, the Theosophical Society's most famous leader, succeeded Blavitsky and became the first and only British woman to serve as president of the Indian National Congress, 1917. The Early Congress Movement The first Congress session, convened in Bombay City on 28 December 1885, was attended by 73 representatives, as well as 10 more unofficial delegates. Virtually every province of British India was represented. 54 of the delegates were Hindu, only two were Muslim, and the remainder were mostly Parsi and Jain. Practically all the Hindu delegates were Brahmins. 
All of them spoke English. More than half were lawyers, and the remainder consisted of journalists, businessmen, landowners, and professors. Such was the first gathering of the new India, an emerging elite of middle class intellectuals devoted to peaceful political action and protest on behalf of their nation in the making. On its last day, the Congress passed resolutions embodying the political and economic demands of its members that served thereafter as public petitions to government for the redress of grievances. Among these initial resolutions were calls for the addition of elected non-official representatives to the Supreme and Provincial Legislative Councils and for real equality of opportunity for Indians to enter the ICS by the immediate introduction of simultaneous examinations in India and Britain. Economic demands by the Congress started with a call for the reduction of home charges, that part of Indian revenue that went toward the entire India office budget and the pensions of officials living in Britain in retirement. Dadabhai Noroji 1825-1917, the grand old man of the Congress who served three times as its president, was the leading exponent of the popular economic drain argument, which offered theoretical support to nationalist politics by insisting that India's poverty was the product of British exploitation and the annual plunder of gold, silver, and raw materials. Other resolutions called for the reduction of military expenditure, condemned the Third and Globermis War, demanded retrenchment of administrative expenses, and urged reimposition of import duties on British manufacturers. Hame, who is credited with organizing the Indian National Congress, attended the first session of the Congress as the only British delegate. Sir William Wedderburn, 1838-1918, Gokhale's closest British advisor and himself later elected twice to serve as President of the Congress, and William Wordsworth, principal of Elphinstone College, both appeared as observers. Most Britons in India, however, either ignored the Congress and its resolutions as the action and demands of a microscopic minority of India's diverse millions or considered them the rantings of disloyal extremists. Despite this combination of official disdain and hostility, the Congress quickly won substantial Indian support and within two years had grown to number more than 600 delegates. In 1888, when Viceroy Dufferin on the eve of his departure from India dismissed the Congress as microscopic, it mustered 1,248 delegates at its annual meeting. Still, British officials continued to dismiss the significance of the Congress, and more than a decade later Viceroy Curzon claimed, perhaps wishfully, that it was tottering to its fall. Curzon, however, inadvertently helped to infuse the Congress with unprecedented popularity and militant vitality by his own arrogance and by failing to appreciate the importance of human sympathy in his relentless drive toward greater efficiency. The First Partition of Bengal The First Partition of Bengal in 1905 brought that province to the brink of open rebellion. With some 85 million people, Bengal was admittedly much too large for a single province and merited reorganization and intelligent division. The line drawn by Lord Curzon's government, however, cut through the heart of the Bengali-speaking nation, leaving Western Bengal's Bhadralok, the intellectual Hindu leadership of Calcutta, tied to the much less politically active Bihari and Oriya-speaking Hindus to their north and south. A new Muslim-majority province of eastern Bengal and Assam was created with its capital at Dhaka, now Dhaka. The leadership of the Congress viewed that partition as an attempt to divide and rule and as proof of the government's vindictive antipathy toward the outspoken Bhadralok. Intellectuals especially since Curzon and his subordinates had ignored countless pleas and petitions signed by tens of thousands of Calcutta's leading citizens. Mother Goddess worshipping Bengali Hindus believed that partition was nothing less than the vivisection of their mother province, 
and mass protest rallies before and after Bengal's division on 16th October 1905 attracted millions of people there to fore, untouched by politics of any variety. The new tide of national sentiment born in Bengal rose to inundate India in every direction and Bande Matram, Hail to the Mother, became the Congress's national anthem. Its words taken from Anand Math, a popular Bengali novel by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, and its music composed by Bengal's greatest poet, Rabindranath Tagore, 1861-1941. As a reaction against the partition, Bengali Hindus launched an effective boycott of British-made goods and dramatized their resolve to live without foreign cloth by igniting huge bonfires of Lancashire-made textiles. Such bonfires, recreating ancient Vedic sacrificial altars, aroused Hindus in Pune, Madras, and Bombay to light similar political pyres of protest. Instead of wearing foreign-made cloth, Indians vote to use only domestic, Swadeshi. Cottons and other clothing made in India. Simple handspun and handwoven saris became high fashion, first in Calcutta and elsewhere in Bengal and then all across India, and displaced the finest Lancashire garments, which were now viewed as hateful imports. The Swadeshi movement soon stimulated indigenous enterprise in many fields, from Indian cotton mills to match factories, glassblowing shops, and iron and steel foundries. Increased demands for national education also swiftly followed partition. Bengali students and professors extended their boycott of British goods to English schools and college classrooms, and politically active Indians began to emulate the so-called Indian Jesuits. Vishnu Krishna Chiplunkar, 1850-1982, Gopal Ganesh Adhakar, 1856-1995, Tilak, and Gokhale, who were pioneers in the founding of indigenous educational institutions in the Deccan in the 1880s. The movement for national education spread throughout Bengal, as well as to Varanasi, Banaras, where Pandit Madan Mohan Malvi, 1861-1946, founded his private Banaras Hindu University in 1910. One of the last major demands to be added to the platform of the Congress in the wake of Bengal's first partition was Swaraj, self-rule, soon to become the most popular mantra of Indian nationalism. Swaraj was first articulated in the presidential address of Dada Bhai Noroji as the Congress's goal at its Calcutta session in 1906. Nationalism in the Muslim Community While the Congress was calling for Swaraj in Calcutta, the Muslim League held its first meeting in Dhaka. Though the Muslim minority portion of India's population lagged behind the Hindu majority in uniting to articulate nationalist political demands, Islam had, since the founding of the Delhi Sultanate in 1206, provided Indian Muslims with sufficient doctrinal motor to unite them as a separate religious community. The era of effective Mughal rule, c. 1556-1707, moreover, gave India's Muslims a sense of martial and administrative superiority to, as well as a sense of separation from, the Hindu majority. In 1857 the last of the Mughal emperors had served as a rallying symbol for many mutineers, and in the wake of the mutiny most Britons placed the burden of blame for its inception upon the Muslim community. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, 1817-1998, India's greatest 19th century Muslim leader, succeeded, in his causes of the Indian Revolt, 1873, in convincing many British officials that Hindus were primarily to blame for the mutiny. Sayyid had entered the company's service in 1838 and was the leader of Muslim India's emulative mainstream of political reform. He visited Oxford in 1874 and returned to found the Anglo-Muhammadan Oriental College, now Aligarh Muslim University, at Aligarh in 1875. It was India's first centre of Islamic and Western higher education, 
with instruction given in English and modeled on Oxford. Aligarh became the intellectual cradle of the Muslim League and Pakistan. Syed Mahdi Ali, 1837-1907, popularly known by his title Mohsin al-Mulk, had succeeded Syed Ahmad as leader and convened a deputation of some 36 Muslim leaders, headed by the Aga Khan III, that in 1906 called upon Lord Minto, Viceroy from 1905 to 10, to articulate the special national interests of India's Muslim community. Minto promised that any reforms enacted by his government would safeguard the separate interests of the Muslim community. Separate Muslim electorates, formally inaugurated by the Indian Council's Act of 1909, were thus vouchsafed by Viceregal Fiat in 1906. Encouraged by the concession, the Aga Khan's deputation issued an expanded call during the first meeting of the Muslim League, convened in December 1906 at Dhaka, to protect and advance the political rights and interests of Muslims of India. Other resolutions moved at its first meeting expressed Muslim loyalty to the British government, support for the Bengal partition, and condemnation of the Bokot movement. Reforms of the British Liberals In Great Britain the Liberal Party's electoral victory of 1906 marked the dawn of a new era of reforms for British India. Hampered though he was by the Viceroy, Lord Minto, the new Secretary of State for India, John Morley, was able to introduce several important innovations into the legislative and administrative machinery of the British Indian government. First of all, he acted to implement Queen Victoria's promise of racial equality of opportunity, which since 1858 had served only to assure Indian nationalists of British hypocrisy. He appointed two Indian members to his council at Whitehall, one a Muslim, Sayyid Hussain Bilgrami, who had taken an active role in the founding of the Muslim League, the other a Hindu, Krishna Ji. Gupta, the senior Indian in the ICS. Morley also persuaded a reluctant Lord Minto to appoint to the Viceroy's Executive Council the first Indian member, Satyendra P. Sinha. 1864-1928, in 1909. Sinha, later Lord Sinha, had been admitted to the bar at Lincoln's Inn in 1886 and was Advocate General of Bengal before his appointment as the Viceroy's Law Member, a position he felt obliged to resign in 1910. He was elected President of the Congress in 1915 and became Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for India in 1919 and Governor of Bihar and Orissa in 1920. Morley's major reform scheme, the Indian Council's Act of 1909, popularly called the Molamento Reforms, directly introduced the elective principle to Indian Legislative Council membership. Though the initial electorate was a minuscule minority of Indians enfranchised by property ownership and education, in 1910 some 135 elected Indian representatives took their seats as members of legislative councils throughout British India. The Act of 1909 also increased the maximum additional membership of the Supreme Council from 16, to which it had been raised by the Council's Act of 1892. To 60. In the provincial councils of Bombay, Bengal, and Madras, which had been created in 1861, the permissible total membership had been raised to 20 by the Act of 1892, and this was increased in 1909 to 50, a majority of whom were to be non official. The number of council members in other provinces was similarly increased. In abolishing the official majorities of provincial legislatures, Morley was following the advice of Gokhale and other Liberal Congress leaders, such as Ramesh Chundar Dutt, 1848-99, and overriding the bitter opposition of not only the ICS, but also his own Viceroy and Council. Morley believed, as did many other British Liberal politicians, that the only justification for British rule over India was to bequeath 
to the government of India Britain's greatest political institution parliamentary government Minto and his officials in Calcutta and Simla did succeed in watering down the reforms by writing stringent regulations for their implementation and insisting upon the retention of executive veto power over all legislation elected members of the new councils were empowered nevertheless to engage in spontaneous supplementary questioning as well as in formal debate with the executive concerning the annual budget members were also permitted to introduce legislative proposals of their own gokhale took immediate advantage of these vital new parliamentary procedures by introducing a measure for free and compulsory elementary education throughout british india although defeated it was brought back again and again by gokhale who used the platform of the government's highest council of state as a sounding board for nationalist demands before the act of 1909 as gokhale told fellow members of the congress in madras that year indian nationalists had been engaged in agitation from outside but from now he said they would be engaged in what might be called responsible association with the administration moderate and militant nationalism In 1907 the Congress held its annual meeting in Surat but the assembly plagued by conflict never came to order long enough to hear the presidential address of its moderate president elect Rash Bihari Ghose 1845 to 1921 The division of the Congress reflected broad tactical differences between the liberal evolutionary and militant revolutionary wings of the national organization and those aspiring to the presidency Young militants of Tilak New Party wanted to extend the boycott movement to the entire British government while moderate leaders like Gokhale cautioned against such extreme action fearing it might lead to violence Those moderates were attacked by the militants as traitors to the motherland and the congress split into two parties which would not reunite for 9 years Tilak demanded Swaraj as his birthright and his newspaper encouraged the young militants whose introduction of the cult of the bomb and the gun in maharashtra and bengal led to tilak's deportation for sedition to mandley prison from 1908 to 1914 political violence in bengal in the form of terrorist acts reached its peak from 1908 through 1910 as did the severity of official repression and the number of preventive detention arrests Although Minto continued to assure Morley that opposition to the partition of Bengal was dying down and although Morley tried to convince his liberal friends that it was a settled fact the opposite in fact was true harsher repression seemed only to breed more violent agitation before the end of 1910 Minto finally returned home and Morley appointed the liberal lord Hardinge to succeed him as viceroy govern 1910 to 16 soon after reaching calcutta hardinge recommended the reunification of bengal a position accepted by morley who also agreed to the new viceroy's proposal that a separate province of bihar and odisha should be carved out of bengal king george we journey to india for his coronation darbar in delhi and there on 12th december 1911 were announced the revocation of the partition of bengal the creation of a new province and the plan to shift the capital of british india from calcutta to delhi's distant plain by shifting their capital to the site of great mughal glory the british hoped to placate bengal's muslim minority now aggrieved at the loss of provincial power in eastern bengal Reunification of Bengal indeed served somewhat to mollify Bengali Hindus but the downgrading of Calcutta from imperial to mere provincial capital status was simultaneously a blow to Bhadralok egos and to Calcutta real estate values Political unrest continued now attracting Muslim as well as Hindu acts of terrorist violence and Lord Hardinge himself was nearly assassinated by a bomb thrown into his howdha as he entered delhi atop the viceregal elephant in 
The would-be assassin escaped in the crowd.